G'day church, hope you're doing well. My name's Brad. If you're new here, uh, I've got to say, if you're new here, so am I. Uh, so it's, it's good to be here with you. I'm going to tell you, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, it's been a while since I preach. I preach at uh, early church. It was the first time in quite a few months. Uh, so it's really good to be getting back in the saddle. Uh, can you be gentle with me though? I'm just just getting used to it again. Uh, on that, I do want to say um, a, a really big thank you. Uh, we were able to enjoy long service leave, and s- that is because of the generosity of DPC. And so I, I want to start by just saying thank you so much. Uh, it was very refreshing and encouraging. Uh, so thank you for that. And I do consider it a massive privilege to do what we're going to do now in opening God's word together, uh, it is a strange thing that you send someone off during the week, go and spend time in God's word in this ancient book, and then uh, you'll listen to me for 25, maybe longer, minutes. Um, But it's also a blessing. We know that this is how God speaks to us. Uh, This is where we exist. This is how we hear. And so it's great to be able to do it. I do really appreciate that. Uh, Friends, let's pray together to start then. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the God who speaks. You're the God who speaks to us, uh, to all that we are. Uh, You address us. Lord, we pray for your spirit to do that now. Pray that you'd be among us. Pray that you would be indeed changing us, challenging us, adjusting us, aligning us. Uh, according to your word, so that we are made more like Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to ask a question that I know the answer to. I want to ask, uh, do you talk to yourself? But I know the answer. You do talk to yourself because we all talk to ourselves. Uh, We've got a two-year-old. He'll, you know, jabber away, talking to himself, telling his own stories. Uh, I know you walk into a room and say, why did I come here? To yourself. Uh, I closed my door this week because I needed to talk to myself for a little bit and, like, first impressions matter, so I'm trying not to appear crazy. Uh, I know that you, some of you, uh, some of you refer to yourself in the third person when you talk to yourself. Uh, it's weird, but you know, when you go through an orange light and you're like, go Bradley, go. Uh, some of you do that. Uh, and some of you, I know, maybe, uh, I won't get a show of hands, but maybe when you leave the mirror in the morning, you might give yourself a cheeky compliment. It's like, you look, you're looking good, Brad, as you head on out. Uh, we do that. We talk to ourselves. Uh, this psalm has some talking, someone talking to themselves in it, actually. This is uh, by David, we're told. And psalms, of course, they are songs or poems or prayers done beautifully. This one's by David. And in verses 1 to 5, I wonder if you noticed who he was talking to in it. Uh, he says, praise the Lord, uh, my soul. He's talking to himself. Uh, He's not quite mumbling, you know, how you kind of narrate your tasks. You know, I'm going to close that tab and open the... He's not doing that. It's a bit different, but he is talking to himself. Uh, And he's he's not doing the mumbling, talking to himself. It's kind of this quieter, more conscious, uh, kind of serious, reflective thing as he speaks to his own soul. He's kind of combining this quiet time with a prayer, but it's talking to himself kind of mindfulness, if we're to use a word that we understand today, it's a mixture of those things as he tries to grab his own soul by the scruff of the neck and say, I've got something I need you to do, soul. And what is it? Soul, I want you to praise the Lord. All of this, all of who I am, my most deeply part of me, I want you to praise his holy name. And I love that David is really realistic. He knows that our souls are forgetful. We might like to think that we tell our souls, praise the Lord, and your soul answers, yes, I'd love to. But actually, David knows his soul is going to, it's going to, he's going to have to um, help it praise the Lord. He's going to have to remind it, forget not these things. Soul, wake up. Uh, this, this is what the psalm's going to be about. 
that sometimes we are sleepy, distracted, burdened, whatever, in our souls, and he's going to speak to that. He's going to wrangle his own soul and say, praise the Lord. Uh, And if you're having some trouble with that, let me remind you of some stuff. That's what he's going to do. Now, when he does that, like I've got to say, this is... It's a psalm, so he's allowed to be poetic, be creative. It's it's one of those weird things. It's a weird thing to talk to your own soul. You know, you turn up to work tomorrow and say, you know, I've just been having a conversation with my own soul. That's weird. By all means, share your faith. But that's a that's a weird thing to say. And yet I do want to I, I do think the way he does this, where he's speaking and addressing his own soul, it makes a lot of sense. We, we want to do this, where we want to go, I've got a bunch of values, I've got a bunch of things that I know I need, and I want to address the deepest part of me with that. Uh, actually, that would be something that makes sense kind of anywhere in some ways. I want to align the things that I consider most important and vital with who I am. It's kind of healthy meditation talk thing that we see in the Bible, actually. Taking our values, aligning with how we feel and want to live. Makes sense. So, what doesn't he want his soul to forget? What's he going to say? This is what the psalm's going to be. We're going to break it into three parts. We're going to look at verse 1 to 5. He's going to forget not uh, the gracious and the good. Uh, Number 2, we'll look at verse 6 to 19. He's going to forget not the great. And verses 19 to the end, forget not the glorious. Some of you love structure. You'll be like, good, I know where Brad's going. Others of you, you're like, "I I just want to be surprised. If you're that person, just forget what I said and you'll be surprised where we're headed. So let's dive in. Remembering the gracious and the good. He's going to hit those two things in verse 1 to 5. Open your eyes, soul. This is who the Lord is. The Lord God, this God, he's the one who, verse 3, forgives, heals, verse 4, redeems. Forgives your sins, heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit. It's going to be a big theme in this psalm that God is, the word we we would say, gracious. That this God, the type of character that he has, is that he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. That's why he put it in verse 10. David is in this psalm in kernel form. He's thinking about his God and he can see that this is the sort of God who would indeed send his own son to die for us that this is the God who makes a way for sins to be forgiven. It's a strange thing if we tell our souls, uh, your God is gracious, it's a strange thing that might happen. You might have one of two many responses to that. If you've been around church a long time, you've heard God is gracious, and so your soul might roll its eyes a little. Yes, I know, God's good, God, God loves me, Jesus has forgiven my sins. Uh, you know, I know those things. And this is a moment where David would grab our soul and say, and shake it a little and go, you need to be shaken out of that apathy. Uh, David is saying, soul, do you know who you would be, where you'd be at if God treated you as your sins deserve? Do you know what sort of person you'd be if you were shaped by living a life without rescue, healing, redemption? Soul, do you know how twisted and gnarled you get without God's grace? Uh, So maybe, maybe you've heard it lots and maybe you're apathetic. Maybe, though, you've got another type of response to that. Maybe this soul conversation, deep, quiet conversation, honestly with yourself... Maybe you find your soul actually answers and says, are you sure? Are you sure? Because I'm kind of used to living that this whole universe is all about merit. I I get what I deserve. I've been out there trying really hard to make my place here, keep God or the universe on side. I've been working really hard to make my place here. Are Are you telling me that God isn't actually like that? That he doesn't treat me as I deserve? That he's generous? That maybe, are you telling me that maybe this God's love for me is disconnected from my efforts? I think that David wants his soul to see that. And if your soul sees that, you won't be able to help but praise him. David is saying, soul, forget not that there is this remarkable, unusual, counterintuitive, amazing grace that is sweet, that saves wretches like you, soul, like me, like us. Forget not his benefits, he's gracious. But in those first couple of verses, he changes angles as well. God is gracious, yes, but he's going to do more. He's going to say there's more benefits for you to remember, soul. 
Um, I wonder if you've ever thought about whether or not God cares about your satisfaction. Like we talk a lot in church about salvation. He cares about that if I'm saved. But does God care whether or not I'm happy, satisfied? Does he care about whether what makes me fulfilled, what makes me tick? Does, does God care about my satisfaction? We would have to say, well, yes, doesn't he? Isn't that his realm as well? Uh, this, part, this psalm, David is saying, part of who God is, yes, he scoops us up from the pit. It's a salvation story. But notice where he goes. He scoops me up from the pit and he crowns me. He gives me a place. And he moves on and he says he satisfies us with good things, verse 5. Uh, the picture is of an eagle, uh, the way the ancients viewed eagles. I'm not sure if they understood thermals or whatever. They just went, see, there's that bird up there. It doesn't flap. It just floats. He's just cruising around, unharried, unhurried. They're just kind of this self-renewing animal up there. And so David is saying, this is what God does. Satisfies you with good things. Um, one of the things I think we miss sometimes is that God made a world that is good, that is charged with life, flourishing around every corner. Uh, and we see that in Genesis 1 and 2. That's where we were last week with Pete. And we know that there's a fall in Genesis 3, that part of the curse is thorns and thistles. But notice, notice, even the curse involves the flourishing of something. It's just the wrong thing. God didn't say, Lot, uh, okay, you Lot, you live on the moon now. You know, no growth, no oxygen, no nothing. It's just death. No, he doesn't. It's still a world charged with life. Um, like some of you are farmers, you know that part of your job is to try and stop things from sprouting when they shouldn't. It's just so charged with life, actually, it just wants to get out there and produce more. If God has engineered a world that's so charged with life, uh, does he not consider you with all your desires and hopes and need for vocation and purpose? Does, does he not care about your satisfaction? He might define it differently to what you think satisfies you. You might have to be open to that. But does he care about your longings and satisfaction? Uh, there, there's ways in which we need to be content. But I think we get it wrong when we think uh, the entertainment industry, relationships or your status has the monopoly on your satisfaction and think that God is clueless. No, he's not. Uh, the theological word for this the way God charges everything with life, the way he satisfies us, it's underwhelming. It's that God is good. David is saying, soul, do you know that your God is good? He's picking up that word from Genesis. God saw all he made and it was good, it was very good, same word, that it functions, it flourishes. He's charged it with life. All things are moving towards satisfaction. And so notice, David is saying, soul... There's not just amazing grace, but he's saying, soul, do you notice that there's amazing good? And that too is sweet, and it satisfies us wanderers because he's good. Praise him, soul. Don't forget that. So that's the first bit. We've only done five verses. It's okay. We'll move quicker. Five verses. Soul, don't forget your God is gracious and he's good. And in verse 6, he does this thing where he moves from this quiet conversation with his own soul I don't know why I think soul is here, but that's what I'm signalling. And he realises, actually, it's like he's got other people listening on, not just his own soul, but a whole bunch of souls. It's like he's in the congregation and he turns and lifts his voice. He does a Disney thing. You know Disney songs? They start quiet, the verse, and then it gets to the chorus. And that's when you take a big deep breath in and sing really loudly. It's like he does that in verse 6. And he goes from my soul... And he starts saying, you lot, you souls, plural, all of you, don't forget, forget not who God is. And just as he pans out his voice, he pans out the theme that actually God is big. He's going to dial it up. Verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Uh, that's a big God thing. If you look around the world, you watch the news, you'll say, man, this place is messed up. It's so big, so bad. And it is, but David says, well, souls, don't forget your God is bigger. 
He mentions Moses, and every time we hear that, we're meant to think of the Exodus, where God undone the superpowers of the day, Pharaoh and his army and all of those things. You know, the sea, he divided it. Actually, God is the superpower, is what David's saying. Verse 11 and 12, David goes for big pictures to describe God. What's his love like? Well, it's high as the sky. How far does he separate you from your sin? East and west separation. He knows that you lot and me are small and fragile and fleeting, like dust, grass, flowers. He knows that you know limits, that you age and you wear out and you get sick and you get an injury. He knows that you're small. And guess what, souls? Guess what you need to get right about God? That's not his experience. He doesn't live as a flower. No, his domain, the way he exists, is from everlasting to everlasting. Don't miss that, David would say. Verse 19, he sits on a throne and it isn't one that's going to be rattled because it's in heaven and his rule extends over all. He is powerful and just, vast, inexhaustible. He's mighty and unspeakable. Like we, we get that God is big. But here's where he goes. He goes, do you know how God has used his power? Um, there are times in the Bible when we read of God and he breaks trees with his voice. He's just kind of got that sort of power. But that's not what he's going to talk about here. He's going to say that God uses his power. How? Uh, the melody of this song is that God uses his power uh, to bring us close or actually to draw himself to a people, to commit himself to a people. God uses his power to commit himself to his people in love. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, on my trip, I read some books. Uh, I read an ancient book. I read uh, The Odyssey, uh, written by a bloke named Homer. It's about 2,700 years old. Uh, don't be impressed that I like to read old... You know, it's, it's, just, it's a penguin classic. It was all I could get at the time. Uh, and, it, like, it's so old, uh, the bloke's just got one name. It's like Homer, Homer who? Just Homer, just one name. Uh, and I read this story. You'll know lots of it. It's a classic Greek story it's the story of a bloke trying to get home his name is Odysseus or Ulysses depending what version you read uh, he's been away at war doing the Trojan horse thing if you know about that um, long story short he pokes the wrong cyclops in the eye he upsets the wrong sea god and it takes him 10 years to get home it's kind of classic standard husband running late story right and he upsets a god, but there's actually also in the world that Homer sees and thinks he exists in, that there are other gods and he's favoured by some of them. And the ones he's favoured by eventually overcome the ones that he's upset, right? And he, he gets home. Sorry, spoiler alert, but it's really old. So, This ancient Greek way of viewing the world, uh, that there's powerful forces at work. And sometimes those powerful forces will make it hard for you. But if you do the right thing, they might look after you. Um, we wouldn't say, look, maybe... They, they kept saying that Odysseus is favoured by the gods. Not that he's loved, and certainly not that they are committed to him. They might turn up, or you might upset them accidentally, or they might just, just not be available that day. Who knows? And uh, it's funny, I was reading this book and it reminded me of our world today. Not that we have a bunch of gods. You go down Main Street of Dolby, do you believe in like, lots and lots of Greek gods? The answer would be no. Uh, but, but I do think we live in a world where there's lots of powerful forces and they might favour you. Or they might not. Uh, like, I am just one good meme away from being an internet sensation, right? <laughs> just one. Overnight. Uh, if I could just get, like, my YouTube channel monetized, I'll Mr. Beast this thing. Like, it could work that way, right? If I could invent the right product, pitch it to the right people, I'll be famous and loved and I'll win at life. That's the world we live in. And yet, the same powerful forces could work against me. I could be on the wrong side of a meme and be an internet sensation, and that would be really bad, Right? If I don't predict the trend, uh, if, I, if I poke the wrong internet cyclops in the eye, I could get crushed, cancelled, forgotten, exploited, become irrelevant. And so, for Odysseus and for us, our world knows power and favour, but it's fickle and unpredictable. David says, soul, 
actually that isn't the way the world is. There is a God and he is powerful and he uses his power to draw people close, more to draw himself close to us and commit himself. It says like a family. It calls in that picture of a father having compassion on his children. The way a good dad, the perfect dad, is the servant. He's the leader and head, but he gives himself. Uh, You don't have to hope for and hunt for your big break to be favoured by these forces. The Lord God is above them and he says something different. Uh, we see it, the greatest way that God has flexed his power in becoming, is in becoming a man, is in Jesus spilling his own blood, is in overcoming death and our guilt. It's in him saying those words, my commitment and love to you is now heaven high, your sin is now east, west gone. My love and commitment starts in everlasting and it ends in everlasting. God is saying, I am here. And my might and my power, my throne, it anchors it all. I'm not going away. And David says, sing this loud, souls. Souls, don't forget that your God is big and mighty and he uses his power to commit himself. Soul, don't forget it. Your God's gracious and good and great. Let's use that as shorthand for the God who uses his power to commit himself to his people. It's those things. Uh, Number three. Remembering, uh, not forgetting not uh, the glorious. And so just like uh, David goes from talking to his own soul, talking to the congregation that's there, he's going to fully Broadway this thing and get even louder and he's going to sing it instead, not just to the people in front of him, he's also going to sing it to those kind of beyond our realms. Uh, he turns the volume right up and so that the angels and the whole cosmos and the creation, he is going to remind them that they too have to praise God. Springboards from that line in verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And so it follows that their souls as well, these creatures, other dimensions, whoever they are, they too have to praise the Lord. Verse 20, 21, angels, mighty ones, you lot... Don't forget, join in with us. Heavenly hosts, sun, moon, stars, you lot, forget not. The whole cosmos, the whole creation. Angels, join in with the aardvarks. Rocks and rivers, mountains, minerals, all his work everywhere. Praise this God who is gracious and good and great. And then that last line, did you notice? It drops it right back down. It's actually a really beautiful song. He repeats the line he started with, circles back around, and he says, praise the Lord, my soul. Goes big and comes all the way back down to himself again. Um, What's he doing in this ending? How is he concluding this song? Why is he doing that? Notice what he's doing by going, all of that out there needs to praise God and dropping down to himself. He's saying that this thing of praising God, praising the Lord... It's not just a matter of preference. Like you don't get to just do it as a hobby if you like, if that's the way you're inclined. He's saying don't, don't just remember God is gracious and good and great in your spare time. He's saying that there's something with the grain of this life, the, world, or the way this world is crafted, that if you forget him, if you ignore him soul, if you stay sleepy and distracted, you're going to be out of sync with everything. You're going to be like one half step out of the rest of creation. Uh, Soul, if you miss this, there is a way in which you're going to be lonely and isolated because the truest place for you, the most authentic place for you, is to be tilted toward this God, faced toward him, bowed before the Lord God. Uh, Trampolines are a thing in my life. Uh, I'm not sure the last time you jumped on a trampoline, but trampolines are the heaviest person on the trampoline... Um, tilts everyone else toward it. You're just the weightiest one on there and everyone can't help but kind of bow, tilt, bend or counter to that weight. And and we see here, this is what David is saying, uh, your Lord God is the heaviest thing in your life, in the cosmos. Bend, tilt your life to him. And we see it in Jesus. If you open the pages of the gospel, you will encounter Jesus and you'll see him as the weightiest figure, which is strange because he's unassuming, doesn't throw his weight around, but he has a weight. If you read those pages, you'll see that angels, 
Uh, the unseen creatures in other dimensions, winds and waves, uh, sicknesses, meaning germs and diseases, fish, animals, uh, proud leaders who don't want to be bent toward him, but they still are, average people, souls who love him and welcome him, all are being bent toward him in some way. Uh, it doesn't have the word there, but this idea that all create, cre- creatures must tilt toward Jesus. Um, there's a word we could use, and conveniently enough, it starts with a G. That word is glorious, that our God is glorious, and we see that in Jesus. Uh, the Old Testament word for glory means heavy. David is grabbing his soul, and by finishing great big and getting all the way down to his own soul, he's saying, you don't get... You don't praise God is personal preference. This isn't a thing you do in your spare time. Praising God, pledging allegiance to him is a must do. This is the only place for you to find your place. You'll be at sea unless you circle around and place your rule underneath him. Your God is glorious. He has a weight. He's the one with the final say over you. It's, the, it's he, only his word that matters His opinion is the only one that counts. And until you tilt toward him, you'll be pushed around by other people's opinions, chasing other people's approval. You'll live before the face of the glorious one and experience the freedom of having an audience of one. This psalm then, God is gracious, good, great, glorious. Uh, Tim Chester calls these life-changing truths, that they actually affect us when we see God for who he is. That if you have this honest conversation with your soul, which isn't weird, if you find that your soul, once you talk to it, is weary, distracted, splintered, broken, uh, part, part of the solution, David would say, is to forget not. Forget not that you need to praise him for good reason. That if you see Jesus as gracious, you won't be worn out trying to make your name in the world. If you see Jesus as good, you won't be worn out chasing things that were never made to satisfy you. If you see Jesus as great, you won't be worn out trying to control everything. He's on the throne, not you. That if you see Jesus as glorious, you won't be worn out caring too much what other people think of you. You can find rest in the place he has for you in the world. Uh, I'm going to keep using those words shorthand words to describe who God is. I'll remind you the way we're using them, the way we're loading them up. But for now, let me finish. Praise the Lord, all you souls. Uh, All your inmost being, praise him. Praise the Lord, you lot, and forget not his benefits. Let me pray for us. Lord, I ask for access to our own souls, to be able to speak, for space to think, to feel and to quiet our souls. Lord, we are busy people with lots of distractions. But Lord, would you help us do that? Like David in the psalm, uh, do what you need to do in us so that alignment work can happen between who you are and who we are. Don't let us forget, please, Lord. Help us see all of the time, again and again, in a billion different ways, that you are gracious and good and great and glorious. And Lord, please, may those words have more meaning than just words, categories, that indeed we might say we've experienced God's grace, his goodness, his greatness, his glory. Lead us in this to praise with our souls. Amen.